So that was quite a sacrifice for Caitlin to stand up front here, and just so you know. And so I was thinking about uh, the comment Debbie made that I wouldn't go there with the men. That's because I'd have to share a room with you guys. Um, so just so you know, it isn't the roughing it. It's, yeah, so it's uh, sharing a room. Yeah, yeah. I don't even do that on bike trips. I have my own tent, so, you know. Anyhow, today I want to talk about worry. And uh, isn't that a great thing to talk about these days? That have have you ever had, you know, sometimes you just want to get a good worry on. You seem like it, you know. And and you tell someone, well, you know, don't worry. And they're like, no, no, I need to. And... uh, you get a good worry on, and and, and uh, someone comes along, and what do they say? Don't worry. That helps. That calms you right down, doesn't it? And you think, well, they shouldn't do that, but Jesus did. Jesus did, and and, I, and that's what we want to look at. We're at that part in the Sermon on the Mount, and where Jesus tells us to stop worrying about stuff, and he gives reasons for that, and. And um, you say, what kind of stuff? We'll be looking at that. But I, I was thinking about that as I was looking at worry uh, as people. How do we, you know, and, you, and sometimes you say, oh, well, it's a cultural problem. No, it's a human problem. Every culture everywhere has worry. It's a human problem. And, and you think, well, how do we handle worry? Right, and there are a lot of ways. Uh, some people lose sleep, and that doesn't improve anything. I, I remember, uh, and I haven't lost sleep over worry in a very long time. In fact, the the one time I can remember was college, so it's been a while. And I must have been eighteen. I was a freshman in college, and and I remember I was I was stressed out about the next morning. And, and what I had to do and all that. Because, you know, there's, there are those points where college can seem intense to a young mind. And, um, and I, I realized at, at, I worried all night and the alarm went off. Right? And, and after that, there was, is like the Lord flipped a switch and said, you know, you're just not going to do that. But we've done that, haven't we? And it doesn't help. And I'm sure it had something to do with an exam, which likely I didn't do as well on because I was up all night. Things like that. And, and we, we, so, so some people lose sleep over worry. The other thing we do about we're with worry is we, we talk about it over and over and over again. And how many have noticed that talking about it over and over and over helps you stop worrying. And, and so that's a, one of the things we do. And, and we get a lot of, how, how many know this? You, when you talk about over and over, you get a lot of conflicting advice, which creates, you know, confusion. And, uh, and in short, we also create worry for others so that they can suffer too. And uh, some people in the face of worry, oh, we, you better laugh because it applies to you, you know. Uh, some people in the face of worry overeat. Some people undereat. Some people take turns overeating and undereating. In the face of worry, we miss out on life a lot, right? And, and we've all either been that person or seen that person, and we've probably both been that person and seen that person, that you're in a room and everybody's having a good time and they're interacting and things are going on and there's one person sitting there and they got a good grouch on. They got a good worry on, right? They can't quite, they, they politely smile and ha, 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 but they can't quite enter into the fellowship because of their worry. They, they're emotionally disabled by their worry. Hurts, doesn't it? And some of you are like, I know that guy. Some of you are like, I'm married to that guy. Um, and we, we, 
we, so as we miss out on life, we fail to think of the things that we enjoy. We get involved in bad habits sometimes in the face of worry and sometimes even sinful habits. So those are the different ways people tend to handle worry. And, and then I got curious, well, what does worry do to us, right? And, and so uh, I didn't go to great lengths to research this. I just looked up something on WebMD. And so it's not like scholarship, but it, it's, they're good enough answers. And uh, so I'm just, I'm going to read most of it, paraphrase some of it. The first thing worry affects is the nervous system. This messaging network of ours that is made up of your brain, your spinal cord, your nerves, and then those, those neuronic cells, not moronic, neuronic, the, the neurons of our mind. Worrying too much can trigger, they didn't say moronic in here, just that was paraphrasing. Uh, worrying too much can trigger it to release stress hormones. So your ner- when you worry, your, your nervous system releases stress hormones. Right, and, and of course, the the two that people know about the most are adrenaline and cortisol, and and how we know what stress hormones do, by the way. They make you fat, is what they do. Just just saying, you know, that doesn't mean fat people worry more. It's just it can have that effect, um, and and it speeds up your heart rate. It changes your breathing. It raises your blood sugar. That's how that happens, and. And you, you send more blood to your arms and legs. And over time, this affects your heart, your blood vessels, your muscles, and other systems. So if we look at that, we think, well, what does worry do to, the, to our muscles, right? Well, when you're troubled about something, the muscles in your shoulder and neck tense up, and that can lead to migraines and tension headaches and so on and so forth. Um, Debbie never gets headaches. She's a carrier, but she, someone said that about me, and I just wanted to have some displaced uh, frustration. Worry affects our breathing. If you're worried a lot, you might breathe more deeply or more often without realizing it. And 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 for a lot of people, that's not a big deal. But you know, if you have a, a lung issue, whether it's asthma or various lung problems, breathing problems or diseases, it, it could complicate things. Worry affects your heart. If it sticks around long enough, something as small as a nagging concern in the back of your mind can affect your heart because it affects blood pressure and can lead to stroke and heart attack, etc. And there's more. I'm just skipping over some of it. Uh, it affects your blood sugar. We already saw that, that there's an increase in blood sugar as the stress hormones are released. And... Um, So there's that, and we all, you know, when you think in terms of diabetes and some of those things, and more and more, they're increasing numbers of adult-onset diabetes in our nation, and there's increasing chronic stress. So it's it's an interesting comparison. It affects the immune system. So here we are, you know, always fighting with the last couple years, fighting with various aspects of a pandemic where, you know, we sanitize our hands, we put on masks, we do different things. And yet worry is like taking off your mask or refusing to wash your hands because it depletes your immune system. So those are interesting things. It can make it harder to fight the cold, flu, COVID, shingles, other viruses, etc. Worry affects your stomach. And, you know, people talk about getting butterflies. If it gets worse enough, some people, you know, will get nauseated, even vomit, and it can lead to ulcers. Um, and uh, what else? Acid reflux, flux, which could lead to Barrett syndrome and, and etc., uh, and then it affects the intestines, right? Because we, we eat and we're worried and that affects our stomach. And then it affects how we uneat is a good way to put that. And uh, so worry affects that aspect. And um, constant fretting can destroy the human flesh. And, and so in the face of that, Jesus Christ, the creator, he who made you, because nothing was made without him, according to John chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ says, 
that we should not fret. And the question we face is, will we fret or have faith? Will we fret or have faith? And I was thinking about it just the other day. I was walking uh, somewhere, and I was just thinking about, uh, of course, this sermon. And I realized, you know, you, you think of synonyms. What, what, what are some synonyms that help define a word and, um, and comparisons that help define a word? And I was thinking about faith, and, and I was uh, dealing with some folks out of town. They're not from this church, but... I do some video uh, conferencing with them, and, and, and there was some discussion about some concerns, and, and I realized that faith is synonymous with waiting, which waiting for some of you is synonymous with worry. But doesn't faith always lead to wait? You go to the Lord, God, what are you going to do? He says, wait a minute. Rich mentioned it in, in, in the prayer room this morning about uh, uh, the story of Lazarus, right? He's sick. And, and they send the message, you know, to, to Jesus and say, Lazarus is sick. And he says, okay, I'll wait a couple days. That was his response. He's sick and he needs you to heal him. And he says, I think I'll wait a couple days. And then he travels. And then he gets there and they're like, if you'd have just been here. And he says, you know, if you'll just wait, you're going to see something, Martha. If you'll just wait. Have faith. Wait on the Lord. And, and we think of that scripture, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And, and you say, well, why don't people have renewed spiritual strength? Because we're no good at waiting. And we know the story of Abraham and, and, and God promises him a son. And he says, I'm going to give you a son and an heir, and all you have to do is wait. And he, and, and he and Sarah talk it over, and they decide to come up with a different solution, and that's problematic. And in the face of waiting for God to take care of you, how many different solutions have you come up with that created new worry? So I realize that faith is waiting. So we, that brings us to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 25 and read a bit. I don't know how far. It looks like I'm going to read to verse 34. And it begins like this using the God's Word translation. So I tell you to stop worrying about what you will eat, drink, or wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds. They don't plant, harvest, or gather the harvest into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add a single hour to your life by worrying? And why worry about clothes? Notice how the flowers grow in the field. They never work or spin yarn for clothes, but I say that not even Solomon in all his majesty was dressed like one of these flowers. That's the way God clothes the grass in the field. Today it's alive and tomorrow it's thrown into an incinerator. So how much more will he clothe you people who have so little faith? Don't ever worry and say, what are we going to eat or, drink, or what are we going to drink or what are we going to wear? But everyone is concerned about these things and your heavenly father certainly knows you need all of them. But first, be concerned about the his kingdom, and what has his approval, then all these things will be provided for you. So don't ever worry about tomorrow. After all, tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And, and you know, there's, that's one of those other sayings that people have when, when you're worrying about something. Well, just take one day at a time. You're like, oh, that makes me so calm when they say that. But, but what is the, what is, who's speaking to us? Jesus. And when we read this passage, you know, if we, if we really think about that in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And, or actually, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and, and I'm sorry, I was just reading it in Greek a minute ago. And um, <clears throat> when we think about that process, and then it goes a little further and it says, and without him? Nothing was made. 
So when we read this passage on worry and we realize Jesus is speaking, it's not, some, it's not just some earthy hippie out in the field. It's the creator. It's the very God that made you. It's the very God that made the birds that he speaks about and the flowers that he is describing. And he knows what worry does to fallen humanity. And, and so we, we can't just dis, be dismissive, saying, well, all people worry. It's just one of those things. We can't be dismissive because our creator is telling us not to. And when, he's, when he speaks of the birds being provided for, he's not speaking just from observation. He's speaking from, from sovereignty. As he is the creator of the very birds he's using as an illustration. And we come to this realization that there is more to life than our pressing concerns. And, and, you know, I've used this illustration before, but it's pretty good. I think when I started driving, gas was, I hate to admit this, it was 29 cents a gallon. And, um, and I'd sometimes run out of gas, and I had a pickup. And, and I'd run out of gas, and I'd call my dad, and he'd come get me, and he'd say, how much money do you have in your pocket? Oh, I got a dime. He says, that would have gotten you home. If you'd have bought 10, you know, but I was too cool for that. So then he said, here's the deal. You better keep your bike in the back of your pickup because I'm not coming to pick you up anymore if you run out of gas. There's no reason for it. You have a job. You're buying burgers instead of gas. You know, that kind of stuff. That was my dad. And so, you know, that was reality. And, and uh, of course, back then we didn't exactly drive a lot of um energy efficient cars uh, and and so on and so forth and I was driving a 41 Chevy pickup so it was anyone's guess what it was kind of gas it was using but um, in the process it wasn't 1941 by the way yeah so <laughs> just just saying and uh, but I remember so then I'm in college Debbie and I were dating and and uh, I remember driving by a station and gas jumped up to 58 cents a gallon. And I thought I was going to die. I remember uttering these very words to Debbie. I will never be able to afford to drive again. So, don't worry about gas or gas prices. God makes a way. God makes a way. And, and that's where we come back to this. There's more to life than your pressing concerns. How much life has been missed by people worrying about things that are beyond their control? How much joy, how much happiness, how much fellowship, how much life have you missed because you're obsessed with things that inconvenience you? Ouch, right? We must enjoy the blessings of life while we have them. How many people have lost the joy of life for long periods of time because of worry? No family, no fellowship. Can't enjoy church because, you know, politics. How many have let their worship be damaged? Don't raise your hand. How many have allowed worship to be damaged by the politics of our nation? And, and you've been robbed of worship. Because of worry. And, and this isn't a rebuke. It's an address. What are we going to do so that our future doesn't look like our past? And, 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 and what I would say is, you know, those are just a couple examples. But don't forget the care and love of the Father. And I was thinking, you know, I like to think about Scripture. I, I, I like that, you know, it pops into my head all day long, all the time. 
and, and uh, it, I, I enjoy that. And, and as I'm dealing with life, a scripture pops into my head and I begin to see the correlation. And, and I, I have to say, I like that. I'm grateful for it. And so that was happening. And, and I was thinking about that scripture, except you become as a little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom. And, and I thought, well, kids, kids don't worry about the finances. You ever notice that? You got children. You ever notice that? Mom and dad do that. Kids don't worry about provision. Mom and dad worry about provision. And we come back to this, trust the care of your father. Become as a child. Let dad look out for you. Jesus is actually saying that. And, 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 and something else about kids we've noticed, though, that applies to us as adults. They're not good at waiting either. That's a habit you picked up in your childhood, right? And theoretically, as you mature, you get better at it. It's a theory. And, and so then, we, you know, as the Lord's describing this, he, he uses the birds as an example. He who created the birds, and he, and he says, look at the birds. And that's verse 26. They don't plant, harvest, or gather the harvest into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more? And I was thinking, well, this is a great time of year, right? The birds are everywhere. I like them, you know. I mean, I don't want them in my house, you know, but I like birds. And, and uh, the funny thing happens every once in a while if I... Uh, start playing an instrument, whatever it is, the birds start lining up on the fence outside the window. <laughs> it's kind of cool <laughs> till the cat comes, but um, then not so much. And cat comes because he thinks it's a dinner bell. The birds just like the sound. Um, <clears throat> but it's a great time for birds. And, and every time you see a bird, you are reminded of God's provision for you. Every time you see a bird, you're reminded that he loves you more. You can hear some right now, right? They got through a hole in the ceiling in a closet, and I'm waiting for them to grow up. It's that simple. So they'll leave on their own. You're like, why don't you get rid of them? God feeds them. I'm not messing with them. It's that simple. And, and so we think of this, that every time you see a bird, you know that God values you. God will care for you. And, and I would say, take your, take your greatest concern and leave it with him because it's a matter of faith. And, and today the reminder is just that, are you going to fret or have faith? Your, your choice today is between fretting and faith. And, and we're reminded, if we think of Mary and Martha again, and, and there's that point where Martha's serving and she's, she's wigged out about stuff, and, and she, tells Je- she interrupts Jesus while he's talking, always a bad thing to do. And, and she says, don't you care about me? Don't you care that my sister's sitting here and I'm doing all the work because I'm a better human being, etc.? And Jesus says, you're, you're worried about many things. But Martha has chosen that which is needful. And it brings us back to that struggle we have between, between faith and fret, between worship and worry. And, and how many times do we get up, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up and have my devotions, and we sit there and we just stare at the Bible worrying about our problems. That's not, that's not a, the best approach to devotional experience, right? And, and so we make our pre- requests made known with thanksgiving, and then we go into the Word. And it's about trust. It is not about, I know things always work out, because they don't always work out the way I'd like to see them work out. But I know in whom I have believed, And not only do I know that he's able to keep that which I commit to him, but I know that he will do what is best for me regardless of what I think. Have you ever had to do things that were best for your children that they didn't like? Only if you have kids. 
and God's faithful, more faithful than us. And, and we begin to see, notice this illustration tells us not to worry about life and its future. Not storing up. And, and, and so that's that whole thing about provision and care and the future. And we look at things changing in this world and we think, oh, there's no future. There's always a future with God, whether it's here or there or in the air. And you cannot accomplish, so the next point Jesus makes is, you can't accomplish a single legitimate solution by worrying. He uses the illustration of living longer. Right? People worry, and it's ironic, because you shorten your life by worrying, and you worry about living longer. And, and he talks about adding a single hour. And what I get from that is this. There are things in life that cannot be influenced by your personal power. And, and you know, that you know, people will say, oh, just think positively. That's an irrelevant statement. Think with faith. Because there's no power in your mind to change those circumstances of life by having a positive attitude. The positive attitude should come out of faith. And, and you know, people who aren't, you know, they're not Christians, they, they aren't praying. If you're going through a trial, they'll say, I'm thinking good thoughts towards you. Whatever. Like that matters, you know. I have a flat tire. You can think all the good thoughts you want till you get a lug wrench. And, and, and we, we get into that. Well, we just think positively. No, think with faith that you know in whom you have believed and that he is able. And, and, and there are things that your personal power cannot fix. Have you noticed that? All the campaigning in the world doesn't make things go the way you want them to in an election. All the hand washing, all the stuff we do, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but all those extra things we think are going to keep us safe, they may not. We can pigeonhole money all we want, and it won't help us if things go the wrong way. And, and you say, well, uh, well what, what should we, and that's what we always, what should we do? Uh, have you ever gone to God, what should I do? And he says, wait. Wait. In fact, as some of you remember, when we started this church, I was working full time uh, hauling chips. I had my own equipment, and and it was getting that time where I had some extra equipment I needed to get rid of, and so on and so forth. And and uh, all you know, but you're busy. You're working sixty hours a week and pastoring church, and it's hard and all that kind of stuff. And and but every Sunday we'd drive by and we'd see my old equipment that I need to get rid of. And David said, "You got to do something about that. You got to do something." And I remember I was praying one day, and the Lord said, just wait. Like, well, I don't know, is that really doing something about? That? Yeah, it's waiting. He says, wait. And all of a sudden, I got a phone call I wasn't looking for. Someone wanting to buy all that stuff, and it was gone in a week. And all I had to do was wait. And if I hadn't waited, it wouldn't have been there. And I'd have lost out on thousands of dollars. It's interesting how the Lord works. God isn't denying your need. That's the next thing we come to. God knows your need. Okay. And, and I was thinking about how God knows our need. And, and he says, don't ever worry and say, what are we going to eat or drink or what are we going to wear? Everyone is concerned about these things. Your heavenly Father certainly knows you need all of them. And God isn't denying your need in the face of your concerns when he tells you to wait. He's not denying that you have the need. He's not disrespecting your concerns. He knows what they are better than you do. 
Here Christ is telling us not to fret, but to have faith that God will provide. And I think of that in terms of God will provide, what? Solutions of all kinds. And, and, and he's, he's remarkably creative in the way he provides. And he never, he doesn't always, I start saying never, but he doesn't always provide the same way each time. Have you ever noticed that? And uh, he provides for your food and your shelter. He provides for your kids. And there are times there are parents, you know, and, and maybe you've heard this from me, you know, as we've talked, that you'll be worried about the destination of your kids spiritually and how they're doing. And, and, and I'll say, well, yeah, but they were raised in church. You didn't even have that option, and you found Jesus. Think about that, that Jesus reached out to you even without you being taught the ways of the Lord. You don't think he can reach them after being raised in a Christian family? See, God knows. And having been a rebellious kid raised in a Christian family and, and walking away from the Lord, here's the thing that your kids will never tell you. They are always convicted. Right? I was constantly under the burden of the Lord. My parents didn't know it. My brothers and sisters didn't know it. None of my friends knew it. Certainly people that would come up and hand me tracks and witness to me didn't know it. But I was just torn. I looked like I was just as calm as still water. But I was torn inside. And I guarantee that's happening to the people you worry about. Because God is faithful. I was thinking of his provision and 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 uh, Psalm 137 verse or excuse me Psalm 37 verse 25 says I have been young and now I am old but I have never seen a righteous person abandoned or his descendants begging for bread quote that when you're worried about the future of your life so then as we think about God's solutions, he has solutions for your job. Maybe you're worried about that. He has solutions for your family or some conflict. And maybe you're worried about that. And, and, and yet these are all things that any normal person would worry about. And so we realize it's not a judgment. We're not here condemned, but we are here con encouraged. That we're not, it's not saying, oh, you're a bad Christian because you worry It's saying you are a normal person that God cares for. And God will intervene, making a way where there seems to be no way. And so as we're wrapping this up, I think of the last two verses, verses 33 and 34 of chapter 6. And it says this, but first, be concerned about his kingdom and what has his approval. Then all these things will be provided for you. So don't ever worry about tomorrow. After all, tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And, and, of course, if we think of the king's English, it's seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And, and I was thinking about this passage and how that works. And so the Lord gave me a couple stories to tell in the conclusion of this. And, and the first one is actually how Debbie and I came to pastor in Toledo, Oregon the very first time. This is the second church in Toledo we've pastored. We came here in 1982. And, um, and I was fresh out of Bible college and... Uh, in the organization I was with, you know, it was kind of like they voted on you. You know, Foursquare appoints you, but, but in, in this other group, I, you, they vote on you. So the, worst, the, the best preacher gets it. I mean, that's kind of how it happens. And so you only need one good sermon to get a church, right? And, and so, you know, there's three candidates, and, and you preach one each week, and then they vote and all that kind of stuff. And and we came, and, and uh, I don't know how to delicately put it, but uh, the, the condition of the church was misrepresented, right? And so the, I think they just added zeros to the back of everything, you know, because there were supposed to be 30 people. There were three. There was supposed to be like $600 a month. There was 60, you know. It was like that, and they were a year behind in their insurance, which is bad, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and that kind of stuff, you know, and... Uh, 
and it was a mess, and, and, and they'd stopped paying their garbage bills, so it was just piled in a tool shed out behind. You know, it was just a lot of stuff. And uh, I went there and, uh, and did my thing, you know, and uh, we went home, and Debbie cried. She begged me to pull my name. She said, Charles, they'll like you. You have to pull your name. And, and I prayed. I didn't know what else to do. God, I need something to share, you know, with my wife. And this, is, this sermon text is the passage he gave me. And we read it every day, every night. We'd read it together. And that was it. We just read it. And in a week's time, we were afraid that I wouldn't get to church. Right? Seek you first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And lo and behold, we came, and there was hard work, and there was trial, and et cetera. But God has so, in all these years of being here, God has so marvelously blessed us, not just financially, but as a family, as a part of the community, as a part of the church. It has been the greatest experience of our lives because God had a plan. And at times, his plan looked like death. But it wasn't. And you're facing some issues in your lives. And I'm telling you, God has a plan. His plan may look like death, but it's not. It's life. There's another time we got in this building, which... Is quite an albatross if you get down to it. You know, it's it's twenty seven thousand square feet, which means, by the way, the roof is. And and it was one of those times we were fighting leaks early on, really bad. You know, you every once in a while you see a water stain and tile. That's nothing. Some of you remember, you know, water pouring over the floor, being here in the middle of the night, sucking it up, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I was coming over here to work on the church roof, me and Lynn. And, uh, and a storm came. I live, I live pretty close to the ocean. Blew the west side of our roof off. All the roofing was gone. Just the sheeting was there. And I was tarping it, just tarping it. And I said, Lord, if you take care of my roof, I'll take care of yours. And I'm pretty sure I got the better deal out of that. And he did. We ended up with a new roof. We've never had a problem since because of the faithfulness of the Lord. In fact, it was funny because Lynn was having leaks too on his roof at the same time. And, and the, they, mis, they misordered the roofing, and it was enough for both houses. So I, didn't, I don't know how that works out, but it was great. And... Uh, and then there was a time, it was a Sunday morning, I, I had a dog, uh, and, and she was a good dog, and uh, in fact, she used to go to work with me and all that kind of stuff, and, and uh, she had been at the beach, uh, she was labbing, and she'd been at the beach, and she got salmon poisoning, and you could see it. I got a Sunday morning, come out, and she's staggering and drooling and falling down in the yard. And I, I prayed over and said, God... I'm going to go do my job before you, and I expect to find a live dog when I get back. I'm trusting you with my dog. Came home. She bounced around the yard, happy as can be, not a sign of sickness. Sometimes it's like that, and sometimes we go through great sorrow before we see the light of day. And I've got those stories, too, I could tell. But in every situation, right? And you watched. I preached with 13 years of kidney disease. I have a child with a debilitating disease. 
happen in every situation, God has been faithful. We don't have to worry because he is God and he is faithful and he's not like us. He's better. You can trust him. So when you come to this issue of faith or fret, you must choose faith. Worrying is a bad habit. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to just raise your hand if you need the Lord to give you a faith that you haven't felt lately. And even as we're doing that and we're praying, and just keep your hand up as we're praying, but I, you have to know faith isn't, when I've walked through the situations in my life, faith isn't me bouncing across the, the ground with joy and zeal. Saying, oh, I've got this. I feel great about this. It's, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm trusting you because I have nothing else. Faith doesn't always look the way everyone wants it to on television, but faith is walking with God in the absence of fruit. Lord, I pray for those who are raising their hands right now that you will, your Holy Spirit will faithfully impart faith to them as they come to your word. That your Holy Spirit will walk beside them, that you will whisper in the depths of their soul that they can wait on the Lord because you are God. And that as people, regardless of what we see before us, we will know in whom we have believed. Not in what we want or what we think, but in whom we have believed. And that's you, Almighty God, our Creator, our Lord, and our Savior. And we trust you with our very lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. We'll see you next time.